and thank you for joining us for our webinar on the coronavirus or COVID-19. ESM has made available a variety of resources to assist you with the planning of how to manage your organization and your employees during this uncommon exposure. Please visit our website and use these templates and modify them to the needs of your own business. This is not a one size fits all solution. These resources are meant to be used as a basis for review and discussion with your own management team. You are able to download each of these policies and safety tips to modify them to fit your business needs. Well, let's start at the beginning. What do you do if your employee notifies you that they have COVID-19 symptoms? Or if you notice your employee with the key symptoms of fever, cough, and shortness of breath, what do you do? These are difficult questions and this decision tree is meant to help you walk through the options. There are no perfect answers, but this guide will help you define your own process. In the bottom right corner are some policies for you to review or create and announce to your employees. Is there an option to work from home? If yes, define what that entails. What is your time off or sick policy? What are your travel limitations during this period? I know that we are all doing what we can personally and as businesses to prevent the potential spread of COVID-19. And the big question that I get is, will a claim be compensable under workers' compensation? The answer is that it will be a case-by-case -case determination. In order for a claim to be compensable under workers' comp, it must satisfy the two-pronged test called AOE-COE. A claim must both arise out of employment and occur in the course of employment to be covered under workers' comp. The facts of each case will need to be investigated to determine if AOE-COE is satisfied. The labor code does have a provision for occupational illness, but like the common cold or flu, the coronavirus would be considered non-occupational unless the employee can provide medical evidence of a causal connection between employment and the disease. An example would be a healthcare worker who's working directly with infected patients, or maybe a teacher who's exposed to infected students. What are the workers' comp carriers saying? The ones that I've talked to are saying the same thing. Prevention is paramount, and if a claim is reported to you, it will be considered on its own merits. The facts of each case will be evaluated to determine compensability. I'm glad to see that carriers are training their claims handlers or even creating specialized units to handle the COVID-19 claims. Another question that we receive is, does an employer have to give a claim form to an employee who contracts the virus? We believe the answer is no, unless the employee states that they want to file a claim or that they are at a material or materially greater risk of contracting the disease than the general public. And there's a medical evidence supporting the link between employment and the disease. There is a regulation 14300.5 that states that illness such as common cold or flu are not work related. Here's what the defense firms are saying about compensability. Is it a reasonable medical probability that the employee's disease is linked to their employment? If, is there an increased risk for this employee compared to the general public? With an up to two week incubation period, it will be difficult to prove that an employee contracted the virus at work, even if another employee tests positive for the virus. Michael Sullivan and Associates published a blog, and this was interesting. He quoted the 1998 Latourette case, which stated, just catching the disease at work will not be enough in and of itself to establish compensability. So as you're hearing repeatedly, we don't know exactly what the outcomes will be. We've already said that an employer is not required to give a claim form to an employee who has contracted the COVID virus unless an employee lets you know that they have contracted the virus and they think they got it at work or they want to file a claim. If an employee tells you that they want to file a claim, a worker's comp claim, or if your business is one that would place the employee in a materially greater risk than the general public, then you should give the claim form and file the claim with your carrier or third party administrator. So first you give the employee claim form to complete. And you submit the claim to your carrier or TPA. And if you usually call in your workers' comp claims, then the intake operator usually will ask you a question like, do you question the injury or maybe do you dispute the injury? And your answer should be yes. And then state that you would like the claim delayed and investigated. 
This will ensure that the claim is assigned to an indemnity claims adjuster to conduct an investigation and not get stuck on a medical only clerk's desk and miss the opportunity to investigate to determine compensability. If your employee has notified you that they want to file a claim or that they think their illness is work related, then you have knowledge. From the date of your knowledge, the carrier has 90 days to conduct their investigation and they must issue an acceptance or denial by the 90th day or the claim is presumed compensable. I encourage you to follow up regularly with the assigned claims adjuster during the discovery period, weekly or biweekly, until a decision is reached. Meanwhile, stay in touch with your employee. Regardless if the claim is considered compensable under workers' comp, you will maintain the care and concern of the employer and employee relationship and discuss scheduling for the targeted return and so on. California employees, you can direct them to apply for state disability if they are off work while they are waiting for a decision on the workers' comp coverage. There are limitations with state disability that pays weekly allowance for lost wages. There's usually is a seven day waiting period, but that now has been waived. So it is a good idea to have your employee file for, for state disability during that waiting period while they're waiting for a determination. What if your employee is unsure if they were exposed or even unsure if they want to file a workers' comp claim? Then I recommend that you give them the employee claim form with lines 11 and 12 completed. That states the date that you were aware that they wanted to report the claim and the date that you gave them this notice. By giving them the claim form, you've notified them of their rights to file a claim and you've delayed that 90-day decision deadline. Now the 90 days starts when the claim form is returned to you. So when you give them this form, you tell them, if you decide you want to file a claim, you fill this out and return it to me. Then you fill out line 13, which states the date the claim form was given to the employer. Remember, you do not make the decision of AOECOE compensability. That's done by the carrier. So if in doubt, file the claim with the carrier and have them conduct their investigation. There are three avenues of wage replacement for employees. Temporary disability, that's paid a week-to-week -week basis for work, under workers' compensation. Then in California, there is state disability, or SDI, for non-work-related disability. Or finally, unemployment insurance for off-work but not disability-related. A coronavirus relief package has just signed, been signed into law, federal law, so there will be changes on a daily basis during this process. Today we are just talking about workers' comp claims and issues, and we acknowledge that as an employer, you have many more areas of exposure, including the alphabet soup of leave laws, ADA, FIHA, FMLA, we recommend that your management team review these questions and policies within your own organization and then with an employment law attorney to provide guidance on these employment requirements. And consider the importance of privacy of medical information of your employee. Who needs to know? Here's another difficult question. If my employee is confirmed to have COVID-19, do I need to tell coworkers to be on alert of the symptoms? The difficulty with containment is that an individual can have the virus for two days or more before any symptoms, according to the current medical opinions. So use that decision tree to determine the best course of action on each individual case. We work with the employment law firm of Littler Mendelssohn, and they have a very good video uh, that's free and applies to and addresses many of the, as the aspects of unemployment law that we have just discussed. What if my employee contracts coronavirus and then transmits it to his family? Well, first we will determine if the employee satisfies the AOECUE rule, and if the claim is considered work-related, then there may be coverage for family members under coverage B or the employer's liability section of the workers' comp policy. This is an uncommonly used coverage. I've only seen maybe one or two cases in my many years of workers' comp but these seem to be uncommon times. So it's good to know that there may be potential coverage for family members. As you can see, the answers are not black and white. We all would like to have the line drawn in the sand so we feel in control of what happens, but instead there are still many uncertainties. I encourage you to keep asking questions, 
keep the communication open with your employees. I think it's important that you let them know step by step what you are doing to taking them, taking steps to make them safe. And hopefully that will relieve some of the anxiety that they may be feeling. Another law firm, Mullen and Phillippe, sent out an email recently that said, stay calm and wash your hands. So I think I'll leave you with that good advice. I encourage you to stay calm, act wisely and in good faith during these uncertain times. As this virus that has now been declared a pandemic by the World Health Organization continues to expose us and our employ employees, your call to action is to review your company policies for your exposure control plan, bloodborne pathogens, your health and hygiene policy, your PPE policy, your work from home options, and your travel policy. We've addressed the exposure control plan on the esminsight.com website, so please visit this for additional information or call us or call your insurance broker if you have additional questions. Finally, here's a list of reputable websites that can assist you with your planning. Thank you for joining us today and we wish you good health.